You know, when you get down below Charleston, the canal was really a mess. It actually stinks. I don't see why they can't clean it up. After all, they have enough brains to figure out how to make those new detergents and those fancy plastics. Why can't they figure out a way to clean up their water instead of dumping all that stuff back into the Kanawha? It's a disgrace. Industrial wastes. The useless byproducts of useful production. Animal and vegetable matter. Oils, greases, acids. All kinds of complex chemicals. Sometimes liquid, sometimes solid being flushed along by the flow of liquid wastes. The typical citizen is repulsed. He says simply, the Kanawha stinks, or it's a disgrace. But it's not quite that simple for the sanitary engineer. It's his job to get rid of all that contamination, or tell the boss to shut down the plant. Somehow it's always more economical to keep the plant running and build outfall pipes like this to the river. <laughs> ugly end of the Charleston complex. It is a cluster of chemical manufacturing plants along the banks of the Kanawha River in West Virginia. Submerged pipes draw river water into the plants. Intriguing, often secret processes take place as chemicals and synthetics are made. And then comes the great payoff. The used water is turned back into the river with a little extra bonus of contamination for good measure. In the manufacturing process, wash water carries along what it washed off. As unwanted substances are separated out, they become involved with water. And then there are drippings and droppings, samplings and spills, and leaks and leavings that are cleaned up with hose and water. Everything that can flow moves inexorably down drains, through pipes, out sluices, and tumbles into the Kanawha. Then, of course, into the Ohio. But it wasn't always like this. In 1773, George Washington wrote, none can exceed these lands in luxuriance of soil or convenience of situation, all of them lying upon the banks of either the Ohio or the Kanawha, and abounding with fine fish and wild fowl of various kinds, and also in most excellent meadows, many of which by the bountiful hand of nature are in their present state almost fit for the scythe. Even at the close of the 19th century, Charleston was a quiet agricultural town of only 11,000 people. But the Kanawha Valley was rich in coal, oil, natural gas, chemicals, and timber, as well as water. To capitalize on these natural resources, manufacturing plants were built. As the chemical industry mushroomed with the impetus of World War I and World War II, Charleston grew too and became an industrial city. Not a single wastewater treatment plant was built before the end of the Second World War. And in fact, there were none built for several years thereafter. Suddenly, it became apparent that the situation was scandalous. The beauty of the Kanawha had been ruined. The backlog was huge. It would take millions of dollars to build the facilities to stem this flow of filth. As the river flows past Charleston toward the Ohio, it is easy to see and smell the evidence. It is polluted, heavily polluted. This, then, is the nature of today's Crisis on the Kanawha. Is this the inevitable penalty for progress? It need not be. There are ways to curb pollution. Their effectiveness is being demonstrated at many manufacturing plants in the Ohio Valley. This is how boxboard wastes are cleaned up at the Gaylord Container Division of Crown Zellerbach at Baltimore, Ohio. A waste treatment plant like this is really just a few extra processes tacked on to the end of the regular production facility. First, liquid wastes are piped into what they call a save-all. Gravity goes to work here. Heavy sludge containing usable fibers is pulled out the bottom and returned to the plant to be re-injected into the process, thus reusing what might be wasted. Partially clarified water is floated off the top, 
and some of it is returned to the mill for certain uses that will tolerate water of this quality. The excess is pumped into a primary settling pond which has sufficient retention time to permit floatable and settleable solids to separate from the water. The liquid that leaves here needs more than mere settling, so it is sent to an aeration lagoon. Here the environment is right for the growth of aerobic bacteria. These highly active, friendly organisms actually eat up the contaminants and thus render them into more stable matter, which is less putrescible. And then the partially treated liquid is sprayed onto a bed of coarse stones. As it passes through this trickling filter, biological growths which coat the stones catch the dissolved materials and transform them into more elementary matter, some of which can be removed in a final settling tank. Two important principles are applied. First, whatever can be reused is reclaimed and fed back into the manufacturing process. And second, the industrial wastes are progressively treated by different processes until the degree of contamination is drastically reduced. Now the liquid may be discharged into a land spray disposal field, becoming further clarified as it seeps into the ground or directly into the river. Another industrial waste purification plant, but here the technique is different. It serves the Ohio Oil Company refinery at Robinson, Illinois, another of the eight states of the Ohio Valley, which have banded together to fight pollution. Here the oil wastes float, and skimming tanks are appropriate. Again, the salvaged material is useful. The oil is returned to the refinery for processing. Now into a lagoon. As the water lies apparently inactive, nature is silently at work. Heavy material is settling out. Organic pollution is being neutralized by oxidation. And the lagoon also acts as a buffer or cushion, retaining unexpected spills and releasing effluent in accordance with the stream's capacity to assimilate it. Now perhaps you think all industrial wastes come from big mills. But even the cow is a manufacturing plant. She makes milk. In Pennsylvania, which is another member of the Ohio River Valley Water Sanitation Compact, the Rathgeb Dairy gives us a more intimate example of liquid waste disposal. Here we're concerned with washings from cans, bottles, and tanks, and the stable itself. Because of the high organic content, these dairy wastes would eat up the oxygen in the stream if discharged untreated and make it septic. So quite logically, dairyman Rathgeb has bought what is called a package extended aeration plant. It's easy to install and he can operate it without specialized personnel. For further purification, the liquid then goes to a pond. When the effluent is discharged, it looks clear. The stream stays clean. Just as the trend across America is for smaller cities to install sewage treatment, so smaller industries, both rural and urban, are treating to prevent pollution. The chemical industry produces over 400 new products a year, and many of them involve complex wastes, some of which may be difficult to treat. This Eli Lilly Company plant at Lafayette, Indiana, is really a composite of five different manufacturing installations producing large numbers of individual products and involving such diverse materials as pharmaceutical chemicals, crabgrass control chemicals, agriculture feed supplements, and even intermediate chemicals to be used by other companies. Thus, a wastewater treatment plant like this one is really a maze of different processes. The wastes are treated physically, biologically, and chemically. There are literally scores of individual methods with innumerable combinations. The affluent leaving the plant for return to the river is much cleaner than the original liquid wastes. The objective is to reduce pollution loadings so that when mixed with the receiving water of the stream, it will not be objectionable or a hazard in any way. Another Ohio Valley state, Kentucky, is the site of the Carrollton plant of the Metal Thermit Company. Here, organo-tin chemicals are manufactured, and this is what is left over. The question is, 
how well can this little treatment facility handle those ugly-looking wastes? While there's much talk these days about the need for research in the field of waste disposal, known and tested processes are available for most waste problems. Research is needed to solve the challenge of persistent waste products, such as detergents, and to adapt known technology to new situations. But this effluent flowing from the plant symbolizes the progress that has already been made by the eight states of the Ohio Valley. Over a billion dollars worth of anti-pollution works are constantly rendering purification for the wastes of city and industry. Here, instead of polluted water, the manufacturer is returning to the river water actually clearer than the river itself. Again, the Kanawha River, covered with floating pollution, burdened with man's wastes. Could this be corrected? Certainly. But it would require the investment of money, engineering skill, and administrative initiative. Now as you look at the Kanawha, soiled and sorted, none of these seem to be present. But let's look more carefully. First stop, the Monsanto Chemical Works, where they make a variety of chemicals including herbicides, insecticides, and detergents, all difficult to separate from water. Here, lagooning and aeration are being used together. Other full-scale treatment facilities haven't been built yet. The engineers are trying to derive the most suitable methods of treating these particular compounds. They've built a small pilot plant, which is being tested. Among the problems being encountered is difficulty in cultivating the desired bacteria. But when this and other obstacles have been overcome, then the actual full-scale treatment plant will be designed and constructed. Statistically, this manufacturing operation is listed as plant under construction, since it provides tangible evidence that something is being done. And there in the background is the beneficiary, the river. A few miles upstream at Bell, West Virginia, DuPont has a large manufacturing plant that makes organic and inorganic chemicals, including nylon. It uses much water and produces liquid wastes that obviously require treatment before discharge to the Kanawha. Here things are more advanced. These tanks represent an investment of a million dollars. This takes care of one-third of the present waste treatment requirement and will serve as a model for the larger plant which is about to be constructed. Meanwhile, in-plant modifications have resulted in less rejected matter and less money required for treatment facilities because of the smaller waste load. While apparently only one-third completed, this pollution abatement project is really much further along. Most of the effort involved in establishing a satisfactory treatment program occurs at the early stages. First, management has to accept the concept of investing several million dollars on something that will not result in producing product, at best provides a small salvage payback, and is frankly intended primarily to prevent water pollution. Then they must design adequate facilities to do the job. Finally, they have to build. State water control agencies like West Virginia's and the Interstate Ohio River Valley Water Sanitation Commission have found that there is an important factor of inertia. Universally, the manufacturer who does not have waste treatment facilities resists the idea. But once he is convinced of his obligation in the crusade for clean streams, pollution abatement moves forward. Much motivation can be derived from the advice of a competent staff of sanitary engineers who are qualified by training and professional experience to develop plans and works for water pollution abatement that are practical and economical. Additional impetus comes from the realization that development of industry depends greatly on water quality. Here at DuPont, industry has pledged completion of the program, now well underway. Just below Charleston at Institute, West Virginia, the Union Carbide Chemicals Company makes synthetic organics. These enclosed treatment facilities concentrate the wastes until a thick sludge is produced. Here it is, just barely liquid.
But Union Carbide has devised a surefire method of disposing of this sludge. They burn it. It is incinerated into an inert and innocuous material, and the gases are scrubbed before being sent to the stack for final combustion and venting to the atmosphere. The company engineers are justifiably proud of this equipment. Starting with a material which is both messy and highly pollutional, they treat it, burn the residue, scrub the gases, thus preventing air pollution, and essentially have destroyed a potential pollution problem 100%. Another unit of Union Carbide Chemicals, located just a few miles away, is involved in the construction of a treatment plant. This will be a big one, capable of handling 10 million gallons a day of chemical wastes, plus 6 million gallons of sewage a day from the nearby city of South Charleston. It is not uncommon these days for a city and an industry to get together and finance a joint project to process sewage and industrial wastes. The total cost here will be four and a half million dollars. It's no coincidence that everybody is building at once along the Kanawha. These various manufacturers may be competitors, but when they cluster around the same river, they begin to have a community of interest. It would be futile for one plant to clean up its wastes while its neighbor didn't. The first step toward real action took place in 1958 when the 13 largest industries on the Kanawha got together in a meeting which was prompted by the Water Resources Division of the West Virginia Department of Natural Resources. One meeting led to another, and soon pessimism began to dissipate as the various industrialists could begin to see how a concerted program might really work, not only in the public interest, but to their own benefit. One at a time, and each in his own way, the firms hired additional personnel and started to plan, and then design, and finally to build. Details were worked out in meetings of the Kanawha Valley Industrial Committee. The initial objective was to reduce pollution by about one half in the first phase. Then further pollution cutbacks would be defined and achieved. The committee acknowledged its responsibility and promised that the Kanawha would be cleaned up on schedule. Here a member of the Industrial Advisory Committee goes out on the river to test its quality below an industrial outfall. There are many methods for testing water and many characteristics to be evaluated. In the case of the Kanawha, taste and odor problems are the most important to water users, and West Virginia has an energetic taste and odor project. But this is one of the yardsticks used in pollution measurement, the dissolved oxygen test. The West Virginia Water Resources Board wants to see at least three parts per million of oxygen in the river below the Charleston Industrial Complex. This would be dramatic improvement, because when the river is heavily loaded, particularly in the summer and early fall, there is literally zero oxygen, no opportunity for fish to live. This evaluation indicates that the river is overloaded, completely lacking in oxygen. Of course, there's another factor. The smaller the stream flow, the more concentrated the pollution will be. The Kanawha is a normal river, fluctuating between flood and drought. To help iron out these extremes of flow, the U.S. Corps of Engineers has programmed the construction of multi-purpose reservoirs in the Kanawha Basin. Sutton Reservoir, completed in 1961, provides an average augmentation of 400 cubic feet per second during the low flow period of the year. Another reservoir, Somerville, with about three times this capability, is now under construction. During dry periods, the stored water from these reservoirs is gradually released to increase river flow and prevent concentration of pollution. While this is no substitute for waste treatment, it is an important supplement for keeping streams clean. Did you ever stop to think, who owns a river? Well, the federal government and the states have jurisdiction over it. But fundamentally, a river is public property. It belongs to this boy, and he's jealous of his right to swim. It belongs to this fisherman, too. And he likes it to contain good-eating fish, which prefer to live in clean water. And it belongs to these riverside property owners. They abhor pollution 
because it can destroy their property values and the pleasure of living by the water. And it belongs to these folks, too. They live miles away, perhaps, but have a right to boat on the river. And it belongs to these people who live miles downstream on the big river. They have a legitimate interest in the quality of the water that flows toward them and which they must use. A city has an equity in a river also. Each citizen has a right to a source of water that is clean and safe. And industry has its rights too. Most manufacturing plants were built at a particular location with the hope that adequate clean water would be available. But no one has the right to use water and spoil it for everybody else. Those who create pollution problems must provide the solutions. Already in the Ohio Valley, great strides have been made. Nearly 85% of the population is providing adequate treatment for its sewage. And 75% of the over 1,700 industries discharging directly into streams qualify for an adequate treatment rating from the state water pollution control agencies. But what of the future? The prophets of bloom and doom predict even worse pollution problems tomorrow. But it is obvious that pollution can be controlled with the cooperation of city and industry, under the leadership of the regulatory agencies, and with the backing of the people. People like you who want clean streams enough to convince city or industry that it's worthwhile to invest time, effort, and money in the proposition that rivers are worth keeping clean. Thank you.